it's, it seems that you know, when people say that markets hate uncertainty, well, you don't get much uncertainty than this, and we're really moving firmly to the upside. Why? Well, I think the key point is that markets are getting quite pragmatic. You know, we, we don't know who's going to win, but probably whoever wins, we will have to see a, a further stimulus package out of the U.S., which means we will need the Fed to be supportive in terms of monetary policy. And so, as you could see overnight, you know, the 10 year yield came down in the U.S., the 30 years yield came down, the U.S. dollar came down, and all these are extremely positive. So I would say, you know, in conclusion, uh, potentially the FOMC meeting tonight and the wording of the FOMC meeting will be potentially as important as the, the final winner of this election. And if I was to be, you know, a, a bit more specific, the, the five years plan of China for the next five years just came out. All the details have been published yesterday. There's a lot of details in there. This is probably as important as the, the U.S. election from an Asian point of view. And so there's a lot to grind right now. There's a lot of positive aspects and positive development taking place. And they seem, you know, to overcome the, the uncertainty of the, the presidential election itself. David, so when you, we, uh, we look at the, you know, the price action, then we also look at uh, the uncertainty. Then you mentioned that the FOMC could certainly be a bit of light at the end of the tunnel. The question is, what can they do now, the FOMC? Aren't they really fighting against the law of diminishing returns? And that It's the fiscal side which is essential now, not the monetary one. It is. You're absolutely right. But uh, at least what they need is to, you know, maintain a kind of neutral stance, but, you know, say that they do, they do pay attention to the development. Of course, we will have to wait to see for the potential fiscal package. That's a big unknown at this stage, but it will have to come one way or the other. The U.S. economy will need, actually, that second stimulus. You know, the, the prior one was, is dated back April of this year, so it's quite a long time already. And so the, all we need from the Fed is to say, yeah, we will be watching carefully. And, but it's true that for now, the markets are doing the job. I mean, and as we just said, you know, the 10 years yield is very much stuck between a trading range. Uh, same for the 30 years, that there is no stress in the credit market at this point. So this is quite constructive from a monetary point of view and from a credit point of view. And at the same time, we start to see numbers improving. And in Asia in particular, in China in particular, we start to see earnings revision upwards. We also get results from the banks in the region, which are not that bad. And very importantly, the asset, the risk of an asset depreciation cycle doesn't seem to be emerging at this point. And that's very supportive as well to the financial markets. So, David, in terms of positioning, I imagine it makes sense to look beyond the election results, look at three to six months down the road. You talk about how the Fed will do more, ECB will do more, so equities will continue to grind higher. Exactly. I mean, and this is the interesting part is that, you know, on top of the, the sectors which have extremely, uh, worked extremely well, like uh, Internet names in the past few months, now we start to see really new trends emerging. And for instance, you know, electric vehicles are also starting to really get some traction uh, thanks to the expectation for the next two to three years. Uh, we also see actually the, the REITs in Singapore recovering slowly. You know, they've been quite weak while the yield was going up. Now that it's coming down again, uh, this segment is also improving. So actually, you know, deployment of further capital and exposure is made easier uh, for, for investors, and it's diversified. So you, you don't have to take, you know, so much of a, of a major bet. And, and I think that's the reason why, you know, despite the, the setback, which is the end financial postponement, IPO postponement, uh, the market is still reacting positively because it feels quite comfortable deploying across several, uh, several segments. And so, uh, yeah, in the end, this is, this is still quite constructive overall. So with that delay in the end IPO, you're more cautious when it comes to Alibaba. What would you look at? What are the alternatives then? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, we think we, we're going to have to, to be a bit more cautious uh, when it comes to the, the whole group. We, we know this is a group that works in synergies, and so there will be probably more scrutiny. I mean, the, the fundamentals are still extremely strong with the group, but we also know that in the U.S. there is this, you know, antitrust campaign against the, the very large Internet names, and this is actually echoing what's going on in China. So it seems that the two countries are facing the same challenge as to how to integrate those giant companies, which are, you know, penetrating 
penetrating the education uh, sector, penetrating the healthcare sector, and becoming a kind of state within the state. And so th this, is a, this is a real challenge, both for the corporates and the state. And so we prefer to focus on companies which are a bit more specific into their segments. And names like NetEase are extremely interested. Uh, C Limited, of course, for Southeast Asia is also very uh, interesting. And Meituan is, is a good alternative. So we, it's not a case of you know uh, coming out from Alibaba, but it's to diversify probably further away from uh, that, that giant uh, and give us a bit more visibility as to how things are going to, uh, to work out in the coming months and the relationship with the regulator in particular, how they can you know, amend it and make it uh, you know, more peaceful and, and better adapted to the context.